This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the financial support of viewers like you. Long before any rabbits emerged from top hats, before any women were cut in two, even before that initial invitation to pick a card, what was the first magic trick? Probably this, a simple fire, but simple only if you know how to do it, know how to make it happen, when and where you want it to happen. Once, one person knew, and the rest of the people didn't. And on that day, the magician was born. And there's always been people that were the wise men and the wise women that through performance or through storytelling or song or perhaps even through magic illusions were able to share hidden knowledge. It's been said that magic is the world's third oldest profession. The second is advertising. <laughs> Franz Kafka once said that the meaning of life is that it stops. Uh, and that's very much what magic is about, isn't it? It's about mortality. And what are you going to do about it? In a Las Vegas casino showroom, magician Lance Burton is about to confront death before an audience of people who have spent the day confronting blackjack dealers, roulette wheels, and slot machines. The difference is that Lance Burton always wins. Twice a night, this master magician gives his audience what they want. Good entertainment, and though few realize it, light-hearted but concrete reassurance that the forces of nature, even death itself, are controllable. The possibility of controllable nature through creation, transformation, or knowing the secret was first presented to the human tribe by magical religious figures called shamans. And in many places, the shamans are still doing it, as they have for thousands of years, fulfilling a basic human desire to know. The basic motivation behind science and religion, and to a much lesser degree, art, is this notion that the world around us is difficult, uh, problematic, and that there are hidden patterns in the world which, if understood, could make the world easier to deal with. And the world can, in Max Maven's term, be very problematic. If the forces of nature can't be controlled, at least we can try to understand them. Since the beginning, human beings have asked, why does this happen? And why is it happening to me? So the classical role of the shaman is he is the delegate from the community uh, whose commission is to obtain hidden information about secret connections and patterns that may exist in the world uh, to bring those back to the community and therefore make the community work better, to make life easier. To make all life easier by predicting and explaining nature's bigger effects and controlling life's smaller, more personal irritations. The shamans used whatever magical powers or whatever magical techniques they had to impress their patients that they had these special powers. Today, most magicians would say, well, there's nothing sacred or there's nothing religious or metaphysical about sleight of hand magic. But the branches all lead back to the roots of shamanism. Kofiadu is a modern shaman in Ghana, West Africa. When he was born, he was clutching a stone in his hand. The village elders proclaimed it a fetish, a magical object to be worshipped. He will perform miracles, said the elders. 
And that thing I brought from the universe is now here doing miracles. I have power from it. If a sheep is here, I can't command that sheep to die, and it will. From the day of his birth, Kofi Adu has been a fetish priest with the power to control the natural world. The protector, healer, wise man, historian, prophet, and religious leader of his community. And by any definition, he is also a magician. Like the Celts, Maoris, Tlingits, and most of the world's other indigenous peoples, the Ashanti believe magic is as much a part of life as air and water. Kofi Adu embodies that belief. And he's a magician because he uses the tricks of magic to convince the people of his power over good and evil. He believes himself in his magic, but he also buys theatrical makeup from a London mail order house. Jeff McBride. The shamans used perhaps rudimentary sleight of hand techniques or fire handling or big impressive costumes and magical mask to create the impression that they could tap into a magical power or perhaps that they indeed did possess this magical power. Kofi Adu agrees that belief is important, but there's more to his healing than just hope. He knows spells and incantations, but he is also an expert in herbal medicine. This person would be the person that you would go to to find out uh, different healing methods because they were keeping the history alive. This history was not a separate thing. It wasn't just a story. It wasn't just dancing. They kept the stories and the dancing and the music and the medicine, understanding the different herbs, etc. So it was all inclusive. It was not a separate thing. And, and I'm trying to pull all of that together. That is the approach. Once upon a time, deep down in the magic forest, there lived a handsome prince. That's me. He went way up on the mystic mountain to visit the great wizard. And there he received many precious gifts. And on this day, he came down from the mystic mountain. He found his friend Umbute. And Umbute watched as he revealed a bag and dumped the contents out on a stump. Then the prince gathered up one of the Rijumba nuts. And he slowly, very carefully, very carefully opened the nut to reveal the contents inside. He poured the nuts out on the stump, and Ubute watched as the prince broke the nut into small pieces. Ubute did not know what was about to happen, but he knew whatever it was, it would indeed be wonderful. The prince gathered up the pieces, then he took one of the other nuts, he waved it over his hand, and began to chant the secret spell, Rejumba. Rejumba. And then the prince opened his hand to reveal the nut had restored itself. Yes. And then the prince said, what happens here effects what happens here. Then the prince slowly, very carefully opened the nut to reveal, yes, inside there was a whole nut and there were now tiny pieces. Yes. I don't know if, if everybody was fooled by the shaman's tricks and if some people in the tribe didn't know that they were tricks, but that wasn't the point. Science is looking at the universe to try to discover how it works and discover answers to questions. And that's essentially what magic is. If you cast the bones the right way, or if you do the incantations the right way, this will be the result. And somewhere along the line, it says that if you extract a certain root and you boil it or take a leaf and put it on a wound and say a certain number of words in a certain way and invoke a certain demon or a deity, that that wound will be better or more likely to heal. And along in there, someplace, is some medicine. There may be an antibiotic or there may be some sort of a chemical or compound um, that causes the wound to 
recover sooner. So out of magic comes science, eventually. It's magic into science. The proto-scientific nature of shamanism includes prophecy for many indigenous peoples, including the Kwakutl of British Columbia, seen here in 1914. Using different magical sources, from the entrails of sacrificed animals to the voices of the dead, shamans forecast the weather and foretold when crops should be planted, fish should be caught, and war should be waged. So they controlled nature, including the human nature of their enemies, by predicting it. But their resources weren't just magical. By becoming even more sensitive than other tribespeople to natural phenomena and patterns, they became the first professional naturalists, agriculturalists, and more than anything else, psychologists. In ancient Egypt, magic, religion, science, and psychology were profoundly intertwined as well a highly developed magical system affected every aspect of religious and secular life, from birth to death and beyond. The Egyptian court had resident magicians and icons of both religious and magical significance, especially images of the gods and the dead, seemed to be part of every work of art, every building. The moon god Thoth was the master of magic, but he was also the god of measurement, an important scientific discipline for builders like the Egyptians. The pyramids themselves were scientific, religious, magical marvels for their time or any time. In Greece as in Egypt, the shamans became temple priests and the temples themselves storehouses of real and mystical knowledge, that hidden information about secret connections and patterns but magic, science, and religion were part of the temples as well. Some of those temples are pretty astonishing. Uh, the doors would open with thunderous noise, and it was all based on natural science or, or, or their early perception of natural principles. And that's probably what's interesting about Greek magic is that, and Egyptian magic too, is that uh, these people were not scientifically illiterate as we imagine they were. The authorities used their knowledge of science to astonish the people in magical ways. 2,000 years ago, Hero of Alexandria described in his book, Pneumatics, temple doors that opened by themselves when a nearby fire was lit by the priests. The doors were counterbalanced so that when the fire was extinguished, water was siphoned through the system and the doors would close again. The ruins of the Oracle at Delphi and the many other places of prophecy throughout the Mediterranean are evidence that the gods and their priests provided another service that began with the shamans and filled a basic human need. If we accept the premise that the world is difficult and problematic, then of course it makes sense that people want to know what's coming because one of the definitions of reality is that it is filled with dangerous and unpleasant surprises. What is going to happen next? Wouldn't you like to know? Well, actually, if history is a judge, you would like to know, because something that has fascinated and bedeviled humanity since the earliest recorded times is the wish to predict the future. And that's what we're going to do in just a moment, because this is an envelope that contains a prediction of a future event. And I'm going to ask someone to help me in uh, participating in this experiment, and that's going to be you. Would you join me right here, please? What is your name? Wanda. Wanda, hi. You hold on to the envelope, Wanda. That is a prediction, but it's not about you. It's about a person you're about to select. So if you would, point to anyone here, and we'll make a prediction about that person. Go ahead. The young lady there? Yes, what is your name? Pamela. Pamela, let me ask you before we go any further. I have a prediction for you. Do you believe it's possible to predict the future? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Pamela says, yes, it's possible to predict the future. Well, let's find out. Would you take a peek inside the envelope, Wanda? Take a peek. Inside, you'll see there's a piece of yellow paper. Would you remove it? Yes? Yes. 
Would you open it, please? Do you want to see it? Well, I already know what it says. <laughs> it says, yes, this person believes it is possible to predict the future. Besides ritualized prophecy and the use of technology in the art of illusion, the Greeks gave the modern world one thing more, the word magic itself. The magi, or powerful ones, were religious followers of Zoroaster, the 6th century Persian prophet. When the word magic began its use, it was originally a term of derision. It was used by the Greeks to characterize a teaching that was foreign. And you have to remember that for the Greeks, foreign was not very good. They believed that they had the pinnacle culture and that foreign was kind of suspect. So when the Magi came to Greece in the fifth century BC, they were fortune tellers, they told stories of the gods, they did sacrifices, and the Greeks held them in a certain awe, but they didn't trust them. And so magic always had that cast that this is not fully trustworthy. These people are suspect. A case in point from very modern magic. Siegfried and Roy are about to make their elephant disappear. It's an illusion, of course. But how would you feel about them if you thought they actually had the power to do it for real? What then could they do to you? Just as magic can be cynically defined as other people's religion, so magicians are other people's priests. The Magi in Greece weren't the first to feel like outsiders because of that kind of socio-religious isolationism, and they most certainly would not be the last. The Ganges at Benares, India's sacred and magical city. The river here is extremely polluted, yet Hindus come from all over the world to purify themselves in its waters for this is the city of the all-powerful Shiva, the protector and destroyer. So the devout drink a liquid that would have very unpleasant effects on most people, yet they do not get sick. Is it magic or is it faith? There is no easy answer, because the relationship in India between magic and the many religious systems is both extremely complex and magnificently straightforward with a little help. Yellow cotton thread, a single length, which will represent the entire universe. In the stories of India, it is the god Brahma who creates the universe and all that there is. Brahma then retires, and the god Vishnu takes over, and Vishnu sustains and preserves the universe in every moment of its existence. And then, at the end of time, the god Shiva appears and dances the Tandava dance, a weird and terrible dance of fire in which the entire material universe is destroyed in blinding light brighter than 10,000 suns. And the universe is no more. There is only silence, vast cosmic sleep. And out of this cosmic sleep, Brahma wakens himself again. He looks about and seeing nothing, nothing lovely or beautiful, he decides to create the universe again. 
and creating it, he retires, pleased with his eternal play. Although witches have been relentlessly and brutally pursued in India throughout history, street magicians and fakirs have been allowed to flourish as a kind of fake priest, doing everything from simple sleight of hand, like the cups and balls, to controlling nature by controlling its creatures, like snakes, goats, and even themselves. Now from India, where a lot of our magic tradition arises in the first place, we also hear stories of fakirs. They're able to do remarkable things, like sticking skewers into their bodies, and sitting on beds of nails, walking on beds of fire, and, uh, oh, even licking red-hot daggers, if you can believe that. But you see, pain is a very subjective thing. It's different for different people. Some people will feel pain, while others don't even notice the same amount of stimulus. I'm going to straighten out a paper clip here, which doesn't seem to be very sharp, but I think it'll do the job for us. And I'm going to give you a demonstration by actually poking this into my arm. Incredible, but nonetheless true. I'll poke it in right about the hair. Don't get squeamish over this, because remember, I'm a trickster, this is a trick, and what you're seeing is strictly fake, but it certainly looks pretty convincing. Oh, ah, wah boy! Oh, the pain! Huh. Well, what you're gonna see here is pretty gruesome, all right. Oh, don't want it to bleed all over the place, but what you're seeing here looks very realistic, I think you'll agree. You'd swear that I'd really done something terrible to my body, but remember, it's only a trick. It's not what the fakirs do, it's what we magicians do. And now, to, to restore this once more, whew, I think that uh, if you look carefully at my arm, you'll see that, by golly, instantaneous healing has taken place. Ladies and gentlemen, a miracle. Because of their status as pseudo-priests, Indian magicians have the freedom to do amazing tricks about important, usually religious subjects, like death and resurrection, in The Hindu Sword Basket, performed by Jeff McBride and Luna Shimada. And in India, of course, in the Hindu mythology, there's these epic cycles of creation and destruction. And the basket illusion is a classic theme of death and resurrection. You have Kali, you have all these great mythic characters, and in the classic Hindu version, a young boy gets placed in the basket and is sacrificed to Kali, and then through the goodness of the crowd, after they buy little magical rings that the magician sells to them, he has enough money to buy food offerings to give to Kali, so the boy is then restored. Magic is a performance art unlike juggling, acrobatics, or other popular entertainments. The father of modern magic, Robert Houdin, defined a magician as an actor playing a person who can perform miracles. 
That magical actor speaks to the human condition even as an entertainer. Like drama, magic presents the major concerns of life itself, transformation, creation and destruction, the journey from life to death, but in purposely mysterious, inexplicable, and dangerous ways. Metamorphosis, presented by Jonathan and Charlotte Pendragon. Survival, transformation, and escape. A human lifetime in a few theatrical moments. I think it's one of the most perfect illusions in magic. It's an amazing, um, has amazing levels to it. Houdini is the person who gave us the contemporary look of the effect. If it's done at a particular level of performance and speed, it feels like a double escape. One person escaped out, one person escaped in. A little bit better focus, a little bit more speed, begins to feel almost like a penetration. The person penetrated through the wood of the box, and the person penetrated out. We wanted the magic to be up here where we were, so we give it the feeling of transformation. As the art of magic is unique among most entertainments because of subject matter, so the magic audience is unique as well. They wonder how it's done, but don't really want to know. Magic encourages both skepticism about, and hope for, the miraculous. It is, said anthropologist Bronislaw Malinkowski, ritualized optimism. The Indian rope trick is a good example of the magic audience's skepticism and optimism, its desire to believe in the miraculous, no matter how unlikely. Now the scenario of this rope trick is that the magician uh, has a basket sitting there. He takes a coil of rope, throws it into the air, it becomes rigid and it stays up there. That he uh, sends his little Indian assistant, little boy, to climb up the rope the boy reaches the top of the rope and then starts to yell insults down at the magician and such. And it's not clear whether the guy's visible or not. He, said he apparently goes into the clouds in some versions of it. And the magician gets very angry, takes a big sword, puts it between his teeth, climbs up the rope, and you hear screeching and hooping and hollering, and pieces of the boy drop down. And then the magician descends the rope. The rope falls down. He takes all the pieces and puts them into the basket and shakes the basket up. And lo and behold, the boy jumps out in one piece, uh, hopefully. And uh, that's the, the legendary account of the Indian rope trick. Although the rope trick has been lovingly described by many people, nobody seems to have quite seen it, at least not as described. Many magicians have performed versions, this is Kalanag, but done outside, without a convenient theater fly loft, and with a cut up and then reconstituted little boy, no. Nevertheless, the legend persists because we want to believe it, and we want to be skeptical about it at the same time. Skepticism has never been a popular point of view. and You don't have to take my word for that. You can just ask Galileo. I'm sure he felt much better when the church finally absolved him of his wrongdoing 400 years after they ruined his life. So skepticism has never been real popular. And skepticism is just what magic encourages, plus a paradoxical belief in miracles. But for the Christian church, beginning in the fourth century, they were the wrong miracles done by the wrong people about the wrong things, proprietary topics for the clergy, like life and death. Christianity kind of insulated itself from magic well, through its vocabulary. They do magic, we have miracles. You're doing divination, we have prophecy. So by, by changing the vocabulary, they were able to distance themselves from involvement in, in the group. And from that distance, the church threw large, lethal, symbolic rocks at the magicians. Magicians in the medieval times, or even before that, kind of had a rough go at it. Because if you said you had magical powers, you were burned at the stake for being a witch. So here we get to a time in history where there are different competing uh, 
franchises for the same congregation. You have entertainment and magicians and priest healer magicians and all these different varieties of magic. And all of a sudden, if you say you're a magician and that you have some sort of magic, you die. The Ace of Clubs will represent an exceedingly efficient instrument of medieval torture. The King of Clubs, a traveling magician, a sleight of hand artist who has been accused falsely of heresy. I play Torquemada. Well, the device is prepared behind the victim's back, thereby increasing witless anxiety. The Inquisition begins. Do you confess your heresy? No? Great. Perhaps this will loosen your tongue. Actually, the victim's tongue has been removed, so the anguish cries do not detract from the merriment of the moment. Now, you might think that the victim would be inserted into the device. No, the device is inserted into the victim. Much more painful. And it is pushed against the very spine. On good days, you can get them to turn around. But on really good days, you can get them to turn in, side, out. Not only that, you can get them to turn outside in. And not only that, you can get them so confused, bewildered, they actually face half one way and half the other. A quick snap of the spine. This is my favorite part because you will hear the bones breaking. Half of the card is facing in. The other half is facing out. And that's how they searched for truth in the Middle Ages. Eugene Berger's humorous little demonstration of inquisitorial methods would have gotten him burned at the stake in 1450. Lance Burton's serious big demonstration of magical immolation would have gotten him burned at the stake any time between 300 and 1800 A.D. In the latter Middle Ages, the Inquisition turned from heretics to witchcraft with a vengeance. Magicians tried to protect themselves from the Inquisitors as best they could by looking and acting non-threatening. Lance Burton certainly wouldn't have tried cremating and restoring any of his followers back then. In 1584, support for the conjurers arrived from an unexpected source, a retired justice of the peace named Reginald Scott. Horrified by the slaughter of alleged witches, he published The Discovery of Witchcraft. Scott did the unthinkable in the book as far as conjurers were concerned. He gave away the tricks, but no magician has ever complained. Reginald Scott was a remarkable man, uh, but uh, he attributed a lot of these, uh, the, these fanatical movements against the uh, street magicians and against the conjurers and the so-called witches uh, to a total misunderstanding of what uh, could be done by perfectly ordinary uh, physical means. The first edition of his discovery of witchcraft uh, is very, very hard to find today. It was burned by James uh, of England, who succeeded Elizabeth, and uh, he wanted to find witches. He was very big on finding and burning witches. He was a zealot in that direction, and he didn't want the news out that there weren't any such things as witches. Although eventually even James I renounced his belief in the power and ubiquity of witchcraft. Well, it seems as though once the priest function became solid in history, that its aim was to perpetuate the status quo. Whereas the magician is not always into perpetuating the status quo. Sometimes the magician is moving 
the culture beyond the status quo into something new and different. In other words, the magician is an artist. But why risk your life for this particular art? Why would anyone in his or her right mind keep performing magic when the most powerful forces on Earth were trying to kill you for it? The answers then would probably be the same as the answers now. When you first get interested in magic, the just the understanding of how magic works is quite a rush. And then learning it is a whole other sort of transformational feeling. You, you're accessing this power that you didn't know you had. All of a sudden, you can do things that no one else can do. I think the most important power that a magician can have is the ability to be able to help the people that he comes in contact with to be able to show them ultimate human potential, to be able to help them get in touch with their own power. very large proportion of uh, American males somewhere between the age of 7 and 12 uh, go through a certain phase of, of dabbling with magic. Uh, most of them leave that alone when they hit puberty, but some don't. <laughs> Hi, how are you? Nice to meet you. Yes, right this way. Thanks for volunteering. Lance Burton. I like people, I like to meet people, and uh, that's, that's the fun thing about my job, is that it's never the same every night. I mean, it's, it's, it's different every show. Valeria, take one, take one card, and look at it, remember it, hold it up, show everyone your card, show it all around, let people on the side see it, show everyone, except me, don't let me see Larry, and put her back in there, and shuffle them up, mix them up really good, Larry. spectacular magic trick in the show, but it is the most difficult. Ah! It's my job. It's my job. <laughs> One person applauded. No, 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 it's my fault. I should have bought a tiger. <laughs> People, you're all right. Uh, Larry, my friend, what was your card, please? Three of spades. Three of spades. God bless you. Thank you, Paul. There are other reasons to be a magician. If you're good at it, the money's good, too. This is Isaac Fox, an 18th century British conjurer. When he died, he left an estate estimated from 10,000 to 50,000 pounds. And if you're great at magic, not just performing it, but creating it, you can achieve the immortality of Houdini. Harry Houdini has been dead now 70 years. 70 years after his death, he is still doing the first primary job of a magician. He is still successfully deceiving the public. I love this. People say, the name Houdini comes up in conversation, people say, yeah, and wasn't it true that he, he was dumped into the, under the ice, chained and shackled, and then he had to, he got out, but he couldn't find the hole in the ice, so he had to breathe in the airspace between the water and the ice until he could finally find his way back to the hole? Don't tell anybody, but that never really happened. 
It was a story that Harry invented in his own lifetime. A perfectly legitimate thing to do. It's his job to lie. You know he's lying. He's a legitimate magician. Uh, and he's entitled to do that. He's entitled to mislead his audience. But here we have 70 years later, the same lie still being told over and over, still fooling people. I mean, that's, that's a pretty good trick, you know? And perhaps the final appeal of magic to magicians is the satisfaction you get from doing it well. You amaze people and you always get your elephant back. You don't even have to have an elephant to be amazing. Since the beginning, magicians have pleased and perplexed using the simplest objects, coins, cups, balls, and cards. The King of Spades. I call the King of Spades the Big Apple card because like everybody else in the Big Apple, the King of Spades is the one always trying to make it back up to the top of the heap. Look, very slow, very fair, in the middle. You can almost see it as it rises up through the deck and back to the top. I don't see much of a difference between performance magic and other forms of entertainment, with one exception, which is that magic wears its secrecy on its sleeve. I have this very narrow specialty. I know about fooling people. That's what I know about. Can't go to school for it, you know, but that's what I know about. And I know how to use it. This man is serious. All right, I think that's enough. <laughs> Great. Good job, good job. Do me a favor, just point to a card, touch one, I'll show it around to you. This one right here. Take a look at that card, Mac. All right, try and remember it. Okay, now I don't want you to tell me what it is. I just want Jamie you to Jamie Ian Swiss could be performing this trick 500 years ago. Across the table in a local alehouse, one person with cards and skill, another person willing to be fooled. Uh, what card are you looking for? Wait, what card are you looking for? I'm looking for the Queen of Spades. The Queen of Spades? Was it really the Queen of Spades? You're not going to believe this, Mac. It's under my cocktail. You, you can't. Go ahead, it. check it out. Check it out. You'll be wrong. Queen of Spades, not bad. And it's a fun thing, as long as all the cards are on the table, if you will, and it's an honest demonstration, an honest claim. Fair enough. That way, there's no way for me to cheat okay. much. So, uh, I'm going to fool you now. I'm going to lie to you now. I'm an honest liar. Think of any one of them so you'll be the only one to know what card you have in your mind. In the Middle Ages, the honest liars of magic were confronted by authorities who wanted to make a clear distinction between miracles and tricks and didn't need anyone around encouraging secular visions and fantasies. And the magicians had something, a rare and coveted commodity then as now, that made the authorities nervous. We're dealing with power. The issue of power. Magician is perceived, I think rightfully, if he's any, he or she's any good at all, as having some kind of power. And a power is, we have an ambivalent reaction to power because it's ambiguous, because it can go either for us or against us. And that's just the ball game. So magicians tried to avoid the powers of church and state by working the streets, public houses, and homes of the less frightened, manipulating the benign, secular objects of everyday life for an audience that had existed for millennia. Well, regarding street magic, I think it's something that has always been with us, uh, probably since before there were streets. The notion that there are things that are unusual to perceive is something that has intrigued and attracted human beings since they were first capable of making such distinctions, uh, that people found out ways to turn this into, into entertainment and something fun to play with. Uh, is obviously a very early experiment as well. God is in all things, even a matchbox. But surely the devil wouldn't use such a simple object to bewitch us. It must be just a trick. Of course it is, said the honest liars. And they are still saying it. They are still doing it. Now it really does go in the middle, face down, of course. A little riffle is all it takes to bring it right back to the top. Watch again, face down, in the middle. That's usually enough time to bring it right back. Oops, well, sometimes it does take a little bit longer. Theatrical magic is largely a game of perception. 
and you're going to be perceiving for us this evening. What is uh, your name? Kendra. Kendra. Uh, this is a, a little exercise done for your eyes only, but you'll verify for everyone else what's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, two pictures. Over on this side is a picture of a duck, yes? Yes. Okay, and on this side a picture of a rabbit. Yes. Fair enough. Hold your hands out, palm up in front of you, and I'll place these down on your hands. Now, which one was the duck? The duck was over on your left, mm -hmm. and the rabbit was over on your right. Mm -hmm. Here comes the magic part. I say that they will change places. And over here where we had, the duck is now? A rabbit. A rabbit. And over here? A duck. The duck. <laughs> well, as I explained, as I, as I explained a moment ago, magic is largely a game of perception. In fact, there is a duck over here and a rabbit over here, uh, and vice versa. You know, magicians have to know how this wonderful combination of mind and eye really works. I'll give you an experiment to show you a principle. Here we have a red cup at your screen left and a blue cup at your screen right. I want you to look at the red cup over here Keep watching the red cup. In a moment, I'm going to say go, and when I say go, I want you to quickly shift your gaze over to the blue cup. Ready? Go. Now look back at the red one. Go. Question is, did you see me in between? Oh, yes, your eye saw me, yes, but did your brain register the fact? Not really, and magicians know this. You see, that's extraneous information. When you shift from one location to the other, what's in between your mind blanks out. It doesn't need that information. And that's one of the principles that the magicians use to operate by. You will perceive what I want you to perceive, and you will, will not perceive what I don't want you to perceive. Well, how can that be? By directing your attention. And magicians have lots of little clever ways to do this. You know, for instance, if I don't want you to look at my right hand, I don't look at it myself. And if I do want you to look at it, I look at it and then you will look at it too. And just telling you that much, which I shouldn't have told you probably, uh, tells a lot about how magic works. It's about directing attention. This kind of close-up street corner magic is called sleight of hand. To many conjurers, it's the hardest to master. But at least the props are simple, like the cups and balls here in the hands of Jeff McBride. The cups and balls represents that we live in a world of wonders and there's surprises at every turn. It takes place on this little surface and all of a sudden something that you thought was here is over there and it reminds us that reality is subject to change without notice. The names of the ancient conjurers who perpetuated their art have been lost to time, but the art itself survived. In more recent times, we've known who the masters were and what they did, thanks to performer historians like Johnny Thompson. Probably the greatest cup and ball worker in this century was a man named Max Mullaney. He was born in Poland, and he talked something like this. My name is Max Mullaney. I'm a magician, and I'm going to fool you very badly with the oldest trick in magic. It's called the cup and ball trick. This trick is so old, it's older than God. Keep your eye on that cup. I'm going to place the ball on this one, rub my hands, place it underneath like so, and it really goes there. Keep your eye on it. It's gone. It reappears over here. I'll do it one more time, this time on this cup. Watch carefully. I tap the cups, the ball disappears, reappears over here. I'll do it one more time without the cups. Keep your eye on the ball, watch. It's gone. It's gone. And of course, all three are over here. Almost as ancient a trick as the cups and balls is the coin-plucking miser's dream. Jeff McBride. The magician has tapped into some unexplainable force that allows him to be able to pluck coins out of the air. <laughs> this is a secret desire of just about everybody. And the magician shows us that perhaps 
if we access different parts of ourselves, we can pull hidden treasures out of our own psyche and make them visible. Mr. Magic. David Williamson, accessing four coins without plucking them, making obvious treasures do his bidding. The idea is to cause the coins to jump, there we go, from place to place, uh, simply by wiggling the fingers. I'll do it again even. Oh, and the last one's the most amazing point, just like that. So, a lot of people think, because I'm a magician, I haven't got the same problems with money the rest of the world does. Not true. I mean, these days in this economy, you don't have to be a magician in order to make money disappear. But just like in the real world, the hardest part, that's making it come back. Now, in order to take a coin like that and sort of make it flicker in and out of reality, a little metaphysics there, it's really a series of complex steps which I'll try and break down for you. Now, you begin with a coin. That's a coin. You give it a little squeeze. Now you can break it into two invisible pieces, which you then have to uh, catch. Once you catch them, you squeeze them back down into a little invisible ball. You rub the ball, toss it in the air, catch it over here, wave your hands over, it comes back as a coin. You put all that together, some people call it magic. Other people just call it strange. Of course, even magicians have to deal with inflation. You all know what that is. Sleight of hand doesn't always involve inanimate objects. Magic's power over nature can be demonstrated by the magician's power over its creatures. This is the Dove Master, Channing Pollock, whose devoted fans included practically every other magician, like Max Maven. Channing's technical skills were top of the line, and his stage presence was just awesome and Pollock protege, Lance Burton. Channing transcended magic. He wasn't the first magician to use live birds that had been around for centuries. Uh, magicians had done tricks with livestock. But Channing, the act that he put together was so simple and elegant in its plot. He just created life. After this 1959 Italian film was seen by astonished magicians around the world, Channing Pollock also unintentionally created a lot of bird acts. Because of Pollock, fledgling birdmen couldn't wait to load their own swallowtail coats with doves. Everybody and their uncle was doing birds and they were all doing Channing Pollock's act, almost verbatim or pieces of his act. I didn't meet Channing physically uh, in person until 1966. That he said, if you're getting back into the business, why don't you uh, take my act? He said, I don't think I'm going to be doing it long. And I said, well, Channing, why would I want to do that? Everybody in magic's doing your act. So Johnny Thompson adapted the act by making it funny. Lance Burton does much of Channing's act, but he also leaves the birds in their cages. And the bird goes on. This is Canadian Jason Byrne, 
who has taken a bit from Pollock, a bit from Thompson and Burton and others, and created his own work of art. Cups and balls, coins, birds. Anything at hand can be at sleight of hand for conjurers. From crockery, spun here by British magic pioneer John Neville Maskelyne, to hats, large and small. This hat o' plenty is being manipulated by American magic pioneer Howard Thurston. Slidini, a legendary sleight of hand performer, slightly handling scarves. You're a very pretty young lady, a very, and I like that outfit you got on there. Let's take a look at you. Very nice. It's very becoming. Oh, hold on there, Sarah. Wait a minute. You got a little tag stuck on the back there. Let From his big Las off. Vegas show, Lance get... Burton shows a small child a long know. ribbon. <laughs> okay. <laughs> See this? This is a magic ribbon, and this is for you. I'll tell you how this works. Now, you take this home with you, okay? And now listen, when you go to sleep tonight, you put this underneath your pillow, and when you wake up in the morning, there'll be a dollar there, okay? Now, remember, you just remind your folks the magician said so, okay? Of all the sleight of hand props, none has been so consistently popular over the centuries as playing cards. Widely known, easily handled, they were covered with religious, royal, or mystical symbols that hinted at their ancient origins. From their first European appearance in the 15th century as fortune-telling tablets of fate, playing cards have been the ideal prop for magicians. I'll take the king, cut it back into the deck a little deeper. I won't even touch it this time. I'll just push it in with that eight of spades and that's about how long it takes to come right back to the top. Sometimes people accuse me of cheating. They say I don't really put it in the middle. But look, if I was to put the king in the middle of the middle, you can't get much more in the middle of that, but it still comes back to the top. Among card manipulators, one name is revered, Cardini, the former Richard Pitchford of Wales, who conquered his audiences through character and quantity. It seemed like more playing cards than there are in Las Vegas poured from his hands, hands that were always encumbered with gloves. Lance Burton. And the story was that during the war, he would practice in the trenches, but it was so cold he had to wear gloves. <laughs> and then he... When he got injured, he was in the hospital, and uh, he asked for a deck of cards, and they gave him a deck of cards, and then when he asked for a pair of white cotton gloves, they thought he was nuts, and they brought in a psychiatrist. <laughs> I think of all the manipulators in the 20th century, I think Cardini was the best. What Cardini accomplished was twofold. Max Maven. First of all, he took the level of technical skill 
involved in an act of his type and raised the bar uh, to a height undreamed of before. In addition, he created a wonderful characterization that was original and engaging and offbeat. I think if you are going to identify the magicians prior to right now who had the greatest impact stylistically on magic in general, stage magic in particular, it would be Cardini and Pollock because each of these men achieved such a substantial jump in technical growth combined with such a profoundly original and interesting characterization that the result suddenly became the definition of a magician to almost everyone, including almost all of the other magicians. Right now, I'd like to use these four aces to demonstrate for you four basic principles of card conjuring. The only thing you need to remember for this is the relative position of the aces. So for sake of description, we'll say that the red aces are inside of the deck and the black ace is outside. Red's in, black's out, and four basic principles of card conjuring. Beginning with this one, the snap. If I snap the cards, I can actually make the aces change places with the red aces now outside of the deck and the black aces inside, reds out, blacks in. Now, if I wanted to reverse the process, I'd never use the snap. I'd give the deck a little twist. You get the black aces outside of the deck and the red aces inside, blacks out, reds in. Now, I didn't actually let you see the snap the first time. I'll let you see it, don't blink or you'll miss it. There's the red aces outside of the deck and the black aces inside, reds out, blacks in, and of course you remember the twist with the black aces now outside of the deck, the red aces inside. Now of course I could keep on doing this till somebody likes it, but uh, perhaps I should just proceed to the third principle, which you may find more amusing, less confusing, and twice as educational. What I call, cleverly enough, the slap. Because when you slap the cards, everything changes. You see the aces, they actually disappear. Look, I'll run through the deck quick. If you see an ace, you just shout on out. But uh, I'll get a little ticked off. Actually, there's no aces in sight. Because uh, to tell the truth, in order to bring them back, I need to return to the fourth principle, what I call the flick. A little flick, you get the black ace back the first one. Another flick, you get the second black ace. That just leaves the question now of where are the two red aces. Watch closely as I cover the deck. There are the two red aces. And that's four basic principles of card conjuring. The magic specialty of mentalism is older than cards, possibly even older than the cups and balls. And though mentalism can also involve manipulating objects, Manipulating minds is the practitioner's real challenge. Mentalism deals with thinking, so it, it, it covers uh, a pretty wide range of things. Uh, what in, in recent times uh, has been dubbed psi or psychic phenomena, uh, things of mind reading, uh, telepathy, uh, predicting the future, uh, to uh, some extent psychokinesis, making things move by the power of the mind. Mentalism's diversity is reflected in mentalist billing over the years. The man with the sixth sense, the one who knows, the high priestess of mystery, the white Mahatma, the man with the x-ray eyes, the scientific sensation of the hour, even the man who can read the mind of Mare Hyland, whoever he was. Some mentalists were husband and wife teams, like the Zanzigs, who billed themselves as two minds with but a single thought. They did second sight, Mrs. Anzig, blindfolded on stage, identified objects her husband Julius gathered from the audience, and they were an inspiration for Leslie and Sidney Piddington. Their mental telepathy seemed so real, many people assumed it was, a claim they neither made nor denied. The reason mentalism attracts me uh, is because I, I don't have to lug around big props. No, that's not, that's only a partial answer. Uh, my attraction to mentalism is because it's the closest thing I know of to real magic. Uh, the work that I do is theatrically enhanced, but it is largely based on genuine principles of psychology and intuition. And as such, it spooks even me.
Mentalism's general spookiness and claims by some mentalists of real psychic powers have made it one of magic's more controversial arts from the beginning. The first famous practitioner was Cagliostro, an alleged Sicilian, alleged gypsy, definitely fraudulent seer, whose friendship with Marie Antoinette nearly got him shortened by a head during the French Revolution. Washington Irving Bishop, an American mentalist of the late 1800s, perfected the blindfolded driving trick, but he announced that his effects were due to powers he received from Almighty God. Bishop both prospered and suffered for such claims, including losing a 10,000 pound lawsuit to John Neville Maskelyne, but also attracting much press attention and huge audiences. He died young, too young, according to his mother, who claimed the brain of her cataleptic but still living son had been stolen by overcurious physicians, and she may have been right. Dunninger, who is to mentalism what Channing Pollock is to birds, thought Bishop was the greatest of his predecessors. He also claimed real psychic powers, but without most of the controversy, because he was so good at what he did. Seeing him up close, you realize that it was not the the methods, the gimmicks, the ways he had of knowing this information that he would know about people and reveal to them, it was his personality, the way he developed it. Although impressive in person, the man who billed himself as master of mental radio achieved his biggest success on real radio and eventually television. Today on television and stage around the world, there is Max Maven, who bills himself as Max Maven. We have one card left, uh, and, and in order to get to that, we started with a pack of 53, shuffled not only by myself, but by members of this audience. Uh, from that shuffle deck, you took as many as, or as few as you wanted from wherever you wanted. You mixed them yet again behind my back. I have been standing here with my back to you, and I have called them out in the order you have thought of them with reasonable accuracy. We are down to one card, don't fail me now. It is black. It is a spade. Don't say anything, just listen. Ace, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, jack, queen, king. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, jack. Eight, nine, ten, jack. Eight, nine, ten. Nine, ten. Nine, ten. Nine of spades. Like so many of his predecessors, Max Maven is enigmatic about the true nature of his power. What I'm doing is a very interesting mix of techniques. And ultimately, I don't care whether someone decides that those techniques are all quote-unquote fraudulent or quote-unquote legitimate, as long as they realize that they're not easy. Now, some psychics say they can deform pieces of metal like this, uh, this silver fork, and they say that they do it with magical divine forces of some kind in their minds. Uh, maybe they can, but I can tell you that it's easy to do by trickery, too. Watch this very carefully now. I'll just hold it right out where you can see it in high resolution, and I'll just see whether or not we can get the effect we want. Let me see now. Oh, can you see that? It's happening right before your eyes, ladies and gentlemen. Look at that. One of the tines is actually bending and turning sort of liquid and... Um... Gee, I wonder how that's done. Well, if the psychics say this is done by magical psychic forces, I can show them a much easier method, believe me. I can sit down in front of the card expert and you know run up a good poker hand when he thought nothing was going on. And I can sit in front of the academics and the scientists and say, look, uh, parapsychology claims to have established four kinds of paranormal phenomena in the 140 years that parapsychology has been studied as an alleged science. These are precognition and uh, telepathy and psychokinesis and clairvoyance. I don't believe that any of these phenomena actually exist, but I'm going to demonstrate them all for you in the next hour to demonstrate that they can be fooled and that the most dangerous thing in the world is to think that you're smart enough that you can't be fooled. Even I can be fooled. 
Now let me show you one of the experiments that's being done in parapsychological labs. Now you see, scientists aren't that difficult to fool. They don't know what the magician's techniques are. I have here a metal file box. This is used for um, filing cards. And I have here a die with six different faces on it. This is the way the experiment looks in the laboratory. They toss the die into the box, and then it's randomized. Turned every which way. Now, naturally, it's impossible for me to tell you what face is uppermost on that die. But I can pretend to look through the metal at the top of the box. I'm going to stare through the metal now. I get an impression of a, of a, a small number, not, not a completely small number, a sort of an intermediate number like uh, two or three. I'll, I'll say three. We'll guess at three. In fact, I get a strong impression. Yeah, three dots I see on that. Let's look inside and see whether or not I'm correct. By golly, look at that. Three on the nose. One chance in six of being successful, right? Oh, no. It's six chances in six of me being successful, 100%, because it's a trick. Watch. A common belief about magicians is that the hand is quicker than the eye. It's not. You're usually watching the wrong hand. And it's not true that magicians never reveal their secrets, either. I simply drop the die into the box, really do randomize it. Now, at this point, of course I have no idea of what is uppermost on that die. But what I've done now is something you didn't see before, you didn't notice, because looking at the box from this angle, you can't see it. Look. When their secrets are being used to defraud or mislead the public about the true nature of a performance, many conjurers gleefully debunk the transgressor. I actually cracked open the box at the back here, and I'm looking inside there, and I see that that's a one on the die. So then I casually close it up again, secretly, and I say to them, I'm getting an impression of a very small number, the smallest possible number. I'm getting an impression of a one. In that moment when we're being deceived, we're also very vulnerable. And if the person um, takes advantage of us, in other words, doesn't admit that it was just a trick, or after selling me the ring for 30 cents, also, uh, wants use of my credit card, you, you know, then we're going in another direction that I don't want, you know. Fool me, but then don't rip me off. Besides divinely inspired mentalists, one of the first famous targets of the magical debunkers was spiritualism, an ancient movement that was revived spectacularly in 1848 in the Hydesville, New York home of the Fox family. The Fox sisters were two little girls who created a monster that they could never kill. They were living in a house that was supposed to be haunted. Someone is supposed to have died there, and by doing simple little tricks like fastening a string to an apple and then pulling the string to make it go bump, bump, bump on the floor, and by snapping their toe bones against the footboard of the bed, they were able to produce all kinds of strange noises that uh, other people couldn't quite understand the source of. It was a joke at first. That joke turned into a business and then an industry. The Fox sisters and hundreds of other people became mediums, allegedly putting their clients in touch with the spirits of their lost loved ones, exploiting the bereaved when they were most vulnerable. The spiritualist profession thrived because the clients were ready and waiting. Max Maven. Everyone wants to know what happens when you die because everyone is hoping the answer is something rather than nothing. And the notion of people returning from the grave, uh, ghostly visitations, is, is a hopeful one, that you can still have contact with loved ones who've gone beyond. As the modern spiritualism movement uh, really took hold in the latter part of the 19th century, uh, people started presenting demonstrations of supposed spiritual contact that had pretty strong impact. One of the strongest of these was slate writing, uh, which involved the use of the type of slates that were at that time fairly common in schools for kids to, uh, to take notes and so forth. And the idea was quite simply that the slates would be uh, examined and then uh, two or more of them would be, would be uh, placed together. And then in between the slates uh, would be put a piece of chalk, which I'll do. And then the sitters would ask questions, uh, hoping that some dear lost relative would, uh, would contact them back. And after a while, the slates would be examined. And uh, if there was a message, well, that had a pretty strong impact. Imagine uh, that your relative had passed away and that you had requested 
that they make contact back and uh, they had something to tell you. Eventually, the bereaved got their own champion, a man with an international reputation as someone who couldn't be pushed around by anything, Harry Houdini. Houdini was five feet two inches tall. Let's start there. Here is this very small man in chains, but the chains cannot hold him. Now think about the period in which Houdini lived. It was a period in which immigrants from Europe were flooding into America. It was a time of many little people, many of whom felt powerless. And here was Houdini, sort of one of them, but chains couldn't hold him. Extraordinarily powerful metaphor, don't you think? This was a man who not only could not be held by a chain or a police lock, but he also was allowed to take photographs of himself virtually nude in a time when in any other context that would have been appalling. This was a guy who broke every conceivable boundary. It's the early 1920s, and Harry Houdini, the master of magic, is about to try one of his most difficult stunts. Securely held in a straitjacket and suspended upside down from an office building, the man who amazed the world will attempt to free himself. Some famous magicians invented tricks and illusions. Harry Houdini invented a whole new kind of magic, escapology. He got out of everything from straitjackets to Russian jails, upside down, underwater, hanging from buildings, and always, always in a crowd. But the final passion of Houdini's life, besides Houdini, was exposing those who preyed on the grief and hope of others, because he was one of them, a boy who lost his mother. Spiritualism was all the rage at the time. He had already branded it as a total fake and a farce. But I think that he quite honestly uh, suspected that if there was anything to it, he certainly could connect with the spirit of his deceased mother. And he went to some spiritualists and of course his mother always came through speaking English, uh, a tongue that she never spoke a word of, and he was very disappointed at this, but he was a great fighter for his day, and his, uh, his days ended up with him as a spook buster, so to speak. He was the ghost buster of his day, and he did very well at it. Sometimes by showing how simply it could be done, as simple as good, strong toes on a good, loud, under-the-table bell, or with a bit of cheesecloth. You might go to see a seance in those days, and. You'd sit around a table in a dimly lit room with your hands on the table, trying to call up the spirits of the dear departed. This is approximately what it would look like. Ectoplasm was supposed to be the substance that came from the medium's body and formed up these spirits when they had what they called a materialization. You would call upon the spirits, oh spirits, are you there? And pretty soon in the dark room, you'd see a mysterious substance start to appear. And it appeared to come from the medium's body. Now, the mediums were always very careful in all of their books and pronouncements and their speeches and their sermons to the faithful, to warn the faithful that the skeptics, those dreadful skeptics, said that it was impossible to tell the difference between genuine ectoplasm, like this, and ordinary cheesecloth. Houdini wasn't the only famous magician to go after frauds. Just a few years after the Fox sisters emerged, two brothers named Ira Erastus and William Henry Davenport claimed divine inspiration for ringing their own bells. The Davenport brothers did a spirit act wherein they were tied in a cabinet, a large wardrobe type cabinet. And then tambourines and bells and things that were placed in the cabinet were made to sound and ring. And the people in the audience, for some reason, uh, attributed this to the spirits as opposed to attributing to the fact that they got out of their ropes. Others have done the spirit cabinet since. This is the Willard family's version. But it was only the Davenports, through their spokesperson, Reverend Ferguson, who claimed divine inspiration. Enter young John Neville Maskelin, the future father of British magic. His actual profession was a watchmaker. And he was repairing some gadget that somebody had brought into him in his shop in Cheltenham. And they told him it was a bit of machinery to help this fellow's artificial leg work. But Masculine thought, no, there's more to it than that. 
And he went to see the Davenports, who were American spiritualists appearing in Britain. And he realized that that little piece of apparatus which he had repaired was in fact part of the Davenports spiritualistic act. And he was anti-spiritualist. So he watched the show, realized how they did their tricks, and got up on the stage and said, I'm a magician and will reproduce what the Davenports have done. And he did. Masklin rejected spiritualism outright. Houdini wanted to believe, but found too many reasons not to. But you know, the mistake that Houdini made and that many present-day skeptics make is to take all of this talk about spirits and lump it into the fraudulent category, where in fact people have been talking to spirits since uh, the dawn of civilization and perhaps before civilization when we were hunter-gatherers. And whether that was all fraud or whether there's something meaningful that we can talk, whether there's meaningful elements in this, uh, is, is, I think, an open question. There may be people with real psychic powers. America's Psychic Hotline Network gets thousands of calls a month, and those callers must be getting something out of it. But it's also true that if you don't mind being a fraud, psychic is a good way to go, but be careful where. I think a lot of this question has to do with the context in which something is done. Uh, if someone walks into a person's home and conducts a seance and says, I'm going to, uh, to contact uh, the spirits of the dead, uh, then either they are honest in, in this attempt, in, in what they say they're doing, or they are willful frauds who are cheating people into a false belief system. But there's a middle ground in show business where I think the, the ethical rules change. If someone walks out on, on a nightclub stage and says, I'm going to bring a ghost in here, uh, I don't think they are obliged to say, I'm kidding, uh, any more than at the end of the performance of Hamlet, the actors are obliged to stand up and say, we weren't really killed. When I say the word magician, I'm really saying a lot more than that. I'm saying, I'm going to lie to you. That's my job. But you're safe because, you know, I warned you. Now, the moment your card hits the mat, mm -hmm. you go for it. Okay. Now, if you get there before me, <laughs> highly unlikely, but if you get there before me, keep your hand there. Keep your hand flat on top of it, because if I missed it the first time, when you lift your hand later, well, I'll just okay. get it then. And so I'm kind of like the guy who sells you a ticket to the roller coaster, you know. And I bring you up there. I give you that near-death experience that you want. But I also promise I'm going to bring you back to the place whence you began in a not severely altered state, right? Six of spades. Oh, not bad for the big guy. What was it? Six of spades? Yes, it Turn was. it over. Turn it over. Let's see it. No, it's red. Wait. Wait. Was it really the six of spades? You know, you're not going to believe this, Mac. <laughs> see, it's under my cocktail. Go ahead. Go check it out. Check it out. <laughs> there it is. But the psychic who uses these tools of my legitimate, honest living and then misuses them to mislead people about how the way the world works. So he, he sells you a ticket, brings you up on top of the roller coaster, and kind of leaves you there, pushes you off. Famous magicians debunking fraud still goes on. As alleged psychic surgeons are performing their operations in the Philippines and elsewhere, it is magician James Randi, the amazing Randi, who exposes them not by showing how the trick is done, but by showing that it is a trick. Warning, what you're about to see isn't nearly as ghastly as it looks. All sorts of things appear to come from the center of the body, and the deeper we go, the more we seem to find. Terrible things that are said to be tumors of various kinds but are in reality animal parts that were introduced onto the site surreptitiously. And the astonishing thing is that when it's all over and you just wipe up the mess, you find that there is no trace of an incision. The only thing that's been removed from the patient is that dreadful lump in his wallet. Do you feel any better? I feel fine. Where did he get the bill? 
You know what? Shall we try one more? Everybody do this. Hold up one hand like this and go, tookie, tookie, tookie. Very good. And I'll tell you, if you've done that right, watch the best of all. Even as some of its classic effects have endured for centuries, magic itself has changed in many ways because it is art and art evolves by combining the techniques of the past with the imagination of the present and the respect for both by the artists themselves. But whether magic is used as the basis for shamanistic incantation, spiritual enlightenment, protection of those too willing to believe, or pure, simple entertainment, magicians have always performed their first duty to amaze us, to fill us with wonder and possibilities. One of the realities of human nature is that we define our lives by restrictions. We define ourselves by what we can't do. And one of the functions of the magician is to say, well, maybe we can, or at least maybe we're not as restricted as we thought we were. And by, in this representative, metaphorical, fanciful means, showing ways of transcending the restrictions of nature, busting the natural laws that surround us, the magician is saying, wait a minute, maybe you stopped thinking too soon. Maybe your expectations were set too low. Secretly, we have a desire to transform our mundane, everyday sort of existence into something fantastic and to journey out. The magician reminds us of that. He mirrors that magical potential in us. But it is in our nature to journey farther out, seeking the ever more fantastic. Coins from the air are fine, but we want to fly. With the help of new technology, and in a world less eager to attach the conjuring artist to the burning stake, magic in the mid-1800s began to fly and do a great deal more besides, and it returned to secular versions of the holy temples of its infancy. As the theater evolved, there came a housing again to create kind of a sacred place for the arts. Oh, did I say sacred? And here, the magician moves from the street back into the temple of the arts. Which is the theater, with the magician playing the challenging central role of God, creating, destroying, transforming, the fire and the stake forgotten at last. Do you believe in magic? The Art of Magic will continue with the big stuff. Life, death, and resurrection. This is PBS. We now continue with The Art of Magic. The natural world offers many and varied moments of wonder, but we tend to remember the big tricks. We date events in our lives from the flood of 74, not the drizzle of 82. So it's not surprising that magic, the theatrical art that overcomes the natural world, naturally grew bigger. Magic is about busting the forces of nature. The enchantments of magic point beyond illusion to the great mystery, the eternal transformation of life and death and rebirth. Magic, alone among the theatrical performing arts, asks a question. What does this all mean? This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the financial support of viewers like you. For centuries, this was performance magic, 
cups and balls, coins and cards, entertaining just a few people at a time, on the streets and in the parlors and pubs. Then in the mid-1800s, the Industrial Revolution developed the technological means for aspiring grand illusionists to fulfill their dreams. And it provided them with an audience too, millions of workers in monotonous jobs with a few extra pennies in their pockets, spare time for the first time in their lives, and a desire, a need to be amazed. The magician is Lance Burton, the speaker is Jeff McBride. If you look at the old theaters, or if you look at theaters today, they're built like temples. They were palaces. The magicians moved back into the theater where they could create magical rituals and ceremonies again under the guise of popular entertainment. And they needed that entertainment, guys. If Lance Burton had presented this illusion 200 years ago, his audience might well have assumed it was real and that Burton was a witch possessed by the devil. He would have become the principal log on a large fire in the company of his underclad female familiars. But the Industrial Revolution also heralded the age of science, science we thought would explain all our mysteries, including the mysterious witchcraft of the professional magician. Because it's a trick replaced it's a witch, magicians were allowed back into the secular temples of entertainment to present the grand themes of life, death, and resurrection. Lance Burton is about to reappear in the middle of the audience, in the middle of a contemporary temple of ritual, ceremony, and popular entertainment called the Hacienda. What we're going to see is that the more people are presented with answers, the more people are told to stop caring about things, the more actively people will be searching for that intrigue and that kind of wonder about the world around us. And it might be ironic that centuries ago people went to the church for that and today people go to Las Vegas to see it in a showroom. Las Vegas, an oasis in the desert studded with temples of pleasure, hope, greed, and the $3 all-you-can-eat breakfast. From the couple on a weekend package tour, matching mystical symbols to win elusive coins, to the big spender hoping the little white ball of fortune will fall into the right cup, magic is to Vegas what the Mississippi River is to New Orleans. It's always nearby, even if you never dive in. In this town, unbelievably, there are seven magic shows operating at this time, and there is a magician almost in every review show in town. This is really becoming the magic capital of the world because of this. And Johnny Thompson should know. He's been amazing Vegas since the all-you-can-eat breakfast was 50 cents. But I think magic particularly goes over in Vegas because Vegas itself is about fantasy. People go there with, uh, with dreams of winning countless millions of dollars, of having unbelievable streaks of luck, of having uh, impossible things become possible. And that's, of course, what magic speaks to. Who's the magician? Is it just that weird guy with the funny black outfit? <laughs> funny black outfit? Not anymore. Weird guy? Well, magicians are supposed to be a little weird, aren't they? Siegfried and Roy are big flashy guys with a big flashy act. For many Vegas visitors, their spectacle magic is a must-see experience, like Wayne and Shecky and Les Girls de Monte Carlo. Behold, Siegfried and Roy. Both tourists and conjuring fans, the other Las Vegas illusionist to watch is Lance Burton, an erstwhile Kentucky farm boy who's been practicing magic since he was five years old. Among his biggest fans are other magicians like Jamie Ian Swiss. Lance has taken this form of the classical manipulative, what, what magicians refer to as manipulative magic, uh, the guys who produce uh, all these objects. 
And very often, most of the time, you see performers doing this type of magic, instead of wondering how they do it, you kind of wonder why. The answer is, if you can do it this well, then it's worth doing. Lance Burton's big show starts with small feats of wonder, a tribute to the legendary magicians who are his heroes. So he spews cards and cigarettes like Cardini and produces doves like Birdmasters, Channing Pollock and Johnny Thompson, who sees Burton not as another magician, but as the next magician. There was a lineage in magic. Keller at the turn of the century was the leading magician in this country. And he passed his mantle of magic to uh, a man named Howard Thurston. Dante uh, received the mantle of magic from Thurston. Dante passed the mantle of magic onto a man named Lee Grable. And uh, just recently, Lee Grable passed the mantle onto Lance Burton. With the birds back in their cages, Lance Burton starts the big illusions Vegas visitors expect. But his presentations are still classical, in this case, the backstage illusion first popularized in the 1930s by Dante, where the magician plays the whole effect back to front so the audience can see how it's really done, or so they think. Lance Burton has the showroom and the means to make small tricks look big and big tricks look bigger. Other magicians in other rooms use various techniques to make the relatively simple seem much bigger. Like Jeff McBride's water bowl illusion. Water returning mysteriously to an empty vessel could probably be performed with jam jars in a kitchen, but then it wouldn't be magic. The difference isn't location, it's showmanship.
This is a padlock. It is currently locked. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to give you three keys. You may choose any one you like. Try the key in the lock. Go ahead, put it into the, uh, the hole of the lock. Now, it does fit. They all do. Uh, but if you turn it and the lock clicks open, that means it's the working key. If, on the other hand, you turn it and it only keeps turning, then obviously it is not the correct key to open the lock, and you may take it out and drop it into the glass. <laughs> Nicely done. Try another. All right. For mentalists like Max Maven, who use simple and props to achieve inexplicable results, showmanship is vital to every effect. So in point of fact, we've established that none of the keys work, and that's because I kept the one that does <laughs> separate from the others. Uh, if you'll try it, it's cut almost identically to the other keys, but there's a slight difference, and it just snapped open, and we know that the key does work. Would you take the key out and drop it in with the others? Would you relock the lock? Thanks. Would you take the glass and swirl it around so that we mix the keys, so that you do not know which is the key that opens the lock? Fair enough? Fair enough. You don't. Take your seat. Four keys, only one of which works. Now, if these people were given the opportunity to compare the keys, analyze and examine them, they might be able to figure out which is the one cut differently. They don't get that chance. <laughs> Instead, I'll ask you, please, to take one key. Any one. Would you take one of the remaining keys? And would you take one of the remaining keys? And the last one is for you. One of the keys will open this lock. And this is a test, not of my intuitive skills, but of theirs. Because the four of you are going to stare at that lock, holding your chosen key, until you sense whether you have the key that works. And if you'll put some effort into this, I assure you that a few moments from now, one of you is going to realize that you are holding the proper key. And at that moment, do not hesitate. Stand up and walk over to the lock. <laughs> Don't look at me. Look at the lock. Trust your intuitive ability. And when you feel that sensation that tells you you are holding the key that works, stand up and come here. Don't look to me for guidance. <laughs> Trust your intuitive skills. Close your eyes if you think it will be easier. But sit. Ah! Now, you got a feeling that this might be the right key. Put the key in the lock, but don't turn it. We know they all fit. In a moment, I'll ask you to turn it, and if it simply turns round, well, so much for your intuitive skills. <laughs> On the other hand, if there's that reassuring click and the lock opens up, then you've done it. Go ahead, give it a try. Besides showmanship, the ancient skill of storytelling can always make a good effect better. To me, a good story is as good as a good trick. And in fact, a good trick is a good trick because in, it produces a good story. Hiawatha, and a good story to go with a very small levitation. Once upon a time, Prince Julie went way up on the mystic mountain to visit the great wizard. But on this visit, he was very, very troubled. He said to the great wizard, I cannot learn these things. It is too difficult. And the great wizard said, Oh, my son, you need to understand Miyaba. He reached into his satchel to reveal a tiny little dog. The doll wore a mask that had been fashioned from rejumba nuts. The great wizard laid the doll in his hand. And then he began to chant the secret spell. Kula umbunga, kula umbunga. Nothing happened. The great wizard said, sometimes, my son, you have to try again. Kula umbunga, 
Kulaumbunga. And then the doll started to tremble. And then Prince Juni watched as the doll began to rise. Yes, the doll began to rise very slowly, very slowly. The doll rose higher and higher. Prince Juni could not believe his eyes. And then the great wizard said, And the doll laid down. Prince Juni was so inspired that from that day on, he knew how to fly. Good stories and showmanship are essential to turning little mysteries into bigger illusions. But to get really big, magic uses technology. And as in most professions, technology takes some getting used to. Harry Blackstone, seen here in 1952, was a legendary showman. But he seems daunted by the big apparatus. Not a magician anymore, but just the weird man in the black suit, buzzsawing his screaming assistant. When machines first started playing a major role in magic shows 150 years ago, a magician wasn't necessarily involved, and that was the trick. These are automatons, mechanical figures, and in an age of industrial scientific revolution, they were extremely popular. Like magic itself, automatons started small and grew. Eventually they were life-size and performed feats so remarkable, many people thought a magician was indeed involved, either inside or nearby. One of those automatons, Psycho, became more famous than most real magicians at the time. This was a model Hindu large doll which stood on top of a glass tube completely separated and isolated from the stage. And this doll would play cards with members of the audience, usually whist, and funnily enough, often won as well. The psycho that, uh, that I have is from uh, Harry Keller, the American magician, who uh, had it made in uh, England. Psycho, given to Houdini by Keller, is now owned by illusion designer John Gaughan. Uh, before its presentation, uh, Mr. Keller would invite people out of the audience to help him come up and actually put the piece together. And this uh, was very strong because there's, uh, to prove there's, there's no wires, electricity, or somebody that you don't see working the figure. The original Psycho was created in 1875 by one of the most important people in magical history, a former watchmaker from Cheltenham, England. John Neville Maskelyne founded the prestigious Magic Circle and a conjuring dynasty and himself performed until his death at 88. For 29 of those years, at a legendary venue for all magicians, Egyptian Hall, London. John Neville Maskelyne's uh, arrival at the Egyptian Hall was very well timed because magic was just becoming more popular and was becoming recognized as a proper entertainment. Besides creating psycho and practical machines like a cash register and a pay toilet lock, John Neville Maskelyne also refined this for his top-hatted colleagues, the levitation, one of magic's most enduring illusions.
the levitation can also be spectacular, as performed by Lance Burton. Jim Steinmeier, illusion builder, coming as close as he can to telling how it's done. The whole notion of a, of a levitation is there's nothing on stage, but uh, there's a lot behind the scenes that are responsible for creating that illusion, and, and quite a bit of science as well. Uh, not necessarily astounding principles of science, but very, very solid applications, uh, dating all the way back to the Greeks of, you know, what it takes to hold something up and what it takes in terms of weights and measures and apparatus. Another 19th century European had an even greater effect than masculine on magical performance. Jean-Eugène Robert Houdin, the father of modern magic. He was also a watchmaker, a tinkerer, and an innovator par excellence. Robert Houdin said, we're gonna make this a little hipper and slicker and kind of, you know, this is 1848, man. This is not the old days anymore. We have technology. We're gonna, we gotta slick this up. We gotta pick up the pace. Everyone in those days was wearing long flowing robes and conical hats with stars and half moons on them and very mystical looking. Indeed, throughout the 19th century, many magicians of all races and nationalities felt compelled to present themselves as wizards, often oriental wizards who covered their stages with real Asian objects. Sometimes they didn't understand these objects, which is why the conjurer Okito, real name Theodore Bamberg, once proudly unveiled a beautiful Chinese scroll that said, please do not urinate in the alley. Robert Houdin changed much of that. He went into normal evening dress, which the amazing thing is, most magicians are still working in a full dress suit to this day, although in his time it was common wear. Robert Houdin used the cutting edge technology of his day as part and parcel of his magic show. Now, he also used exquisite sleight of hand and every conceivable conjuring skill, but he used automatic apparatus and watchmaking skills. He used ether as a concept, a theme in presenting one of his illusions. He used electricity to a great extent and experimented with it a great deal at a time when his audience knew not the first thing about it. And Arthur C. Clarke said that any sufficiently advanced technology will appear as magic, and indeed, Robert Houdin could not be a better example. He used advanced technology before an audience that mistook it for magic. Robert Houdin never toured outside Europe, but anyone anywhere who's been to a magic show has probably seen his work and most certainly his influence, from magicians in evening dress to the many illusions he created or refined, like the aerial suspension. This is a neon version of that, created and performed by the Pendragons. important are mysteries, incredibly important. Mysteries are things that inspire us. And the magician's function is simply to provide uh, mystery first and foremost. And that's a valuable function because I think mystery in and of itself is something that 
society requires as part of what makes it work. A society without mystery uh, becomes psychotic. The proof of this, to me, is that in contemporary Western culture, there is very little mystery. Like all artists, magicians ponder the appeal and the benefit to society of their art. They provide needed mystery through increasingly spectacular illusions. But now their illusionary colleagues can levitate football stadium-sized spaceships where no man has gone before, not just a few feet off the stage. Yet magic still fascinates. Why? It's about power. The power over the broken, the power over death. And I think that these messages are still subliminally there. And that's how we can account for the, for the enduring appeal of magic to people. A good magician doesn't say, I'm a magician and you're not. A good magician says, I'm a magician and so are you. Before the dawn of time, there was real magic. And the magician reawakens that wonder, that enchantment in us. Wonder reawakened, enchantment reborn, here demonstrated in Peter Samuelson's Snow. You know, when I was a child, I used to go exploring through the house. And I'd always end up here in my father's study, filled with the mementos and souvenirs of a lifetime of travel. I'd play in here for hours. But out of all the wondrous items that were in this room, there was one thing that always caught my eye. On his desk, there was a paperweight. It was made out of glass so that you could see through it. And it was filled with water. Inside was a wintry scene, snow on the ground. And when you shook it up, there was a blizzard, a snowstorm. I always wanted to get inside. What I like about magic is the way in which it inspires skepticism as a, a, opposed to um, another thing that it can do and does for many people. Oh my gosh, I saw that guy pick a card out of a deck that I thought of. He must have some power over my mind. I think I'll be his slave. Um, you, know, you know, that's uh, really where it's dangerous. But if that guy can make me think he picked the card out of the deck that I thought of, Oh, then that's possible. Politicians could be doing that to me. Um, advertisers could be doing that to me. I think that's really healthy, you know. So, is it fun to be fooled? Well, maybe in the context of the magician, it is fun to be fooled. In the, in the larger context, it isn't. And that's part of what the magician is saying, I think. That... Things aren't always what they seem. There are deceivers about. Wake up. Magic wakes us up in many ways. Paradoxically, it wakes us up to dreams, both good and bad dreams. That may be the key to its enduring popularity. Often without a word, 
Magic speaks to our hopes and our fears. It encourages childlike wonder and adult skepticism. It can be as big as a Las Vegas showroom or as small as your Uncle Bob pulling a quarter out of your ear. And it can be beautiful. Magician Peter Samuelson. As magicians, I think one of the things that we strive to achieve is an element of artistry. And if you approach art, then you really need to ask the question of what is art for or what is it about? And, and I think that it needs to involve a leap of the imagination. It needs to come to a new way of seeing part of the world. major religions or some major religions around the world, there are these themes of life, death, and resurrection. And of course, this is going to be mirrored in the pageantry of the magic show, which is a relatively safe space for ordinary people to witness kind of a cosmic pageantry, a retelling of this great myth. It provokes you and stimulates you in another way to think about your life, who you are, what's of concern to you. That's what a great trick does, or any, any great symbol does. It has multiple meanings that you can't rest with. And sometimes, of course, it's just fun to watch. Consider the levitation, the resurrectional grand illusion perfected by John Neville Maskelin and performed by every grand illusionist since then, except maybe your Uncle Bob. This version, performed by Dante, is from the 1942 Laurel and Hardy film, A Haunting We Will Go. Why has levitation been so popular so long? Flying is about freedom. It's what the primitive shaman did, it's what Christian saints did, and it's what we all would like to do under certain circumstances of one kind of oppression or another. So a magician who presents levitation or flying well is tapping into a very fundamental human need and supporting that need, and we're, we're grateful. Since the earliest times, magic tricks have evolved, especially the grand illusions. The technology has improved, but times and tastes have changed too. Lance Burton is doing a double levitation here, rising skyward lying under a beautiful young woman. If Robert Houdin had tried that, even with Madame Robert Houdin up top, his 19th century audiences would have rioted, but then they'd never been to Vegas. Jeff McBride. Levitation deals with the ancient desire of the human condition to transcend the material world and to evolve towards the spiritual world. That's the nature of life. But sometimes it's just fun to watch. Not all magical manifestations of human desires are as positive and life-affirming as co-ed levitations. There's a lot of masochism in magic. Those grand themes of life, death, and resurrection do indeed include death. And to be resurrected, you must first die. Siegfried and Roy present a hole in Roy.
Although many magic illusions feature images of death, one is infamous for those occasions when it was no illusion. The bullet catch is just that. The magician catches a fired bullet. But at least a dozen times in the past hundred years, something has gone wrong. There was one magician, for example, who used to have the, um, the spectator who was loading this muzzle-loading business. He would have, give him the magic wand to stuff the wadding down in there and get it all ready. And a piece of the magic wand actually broke off in the barrel, and the spectator didn't tell him about it, and fired a piece of the wand through the magician's head, which uh, smartened him up a lot and also killed him. The most famous victim of the bullet truly caught was Chung Ling Su, actually an ex-metal worker named William Robinson, who had also worked as Nan Sahib, Ahmed Ben Ali, Abdul Khan, Hap Singh Lu, and Robinson, man of mystery. But he achieved fame as Chung Ling Su, and even greater fame when he was shot to death in 1918 on stage in London. No wonder the bullet catch made magicians nervous back then. Keller told Houdini, don't do it, and Houdini never did, and it still scares the few who perform it, like Jonathan and Charlotte Pendragon. That is a very dangerous a trick. I mean, it could kill Jonathan. And that always worries me. And I think that's, we probably don't perform it that often because of that, it would make me a nervous wreck. And why nobody should ever try it at home. This is a trick. If you don't know the trick, don't do it. When the Pendragons do the bullet catch, Jonathan, not Charlotte, does the catching. But in many magic acts, the magician is the inflictor, not the inflictee. It would seem that in contemporary magic, uh, most of the suffering is done by the assistants. These days, you find strange performances where people are torn apart or skewered, and in other ways, horrible things are done, and it's all done with lots of smiles and, and dancing uh, and fishnet. In other words, smiling, dancing, fishnetted women. The presence and absence of women in magic isn't solely a gender issue. It reveals a lot about the nature of performance magic itself and the nature of the audience. One reason there are so few women in magic is that magic is a display of power. And within this culture, that is something that traditionally has not been acceptable for women. And so for decades, most women have been powerless assistants on the magical stage, referred to in the trade as box jumpers or tray girls. I called them props when I first saw them. I mean, it was incredible. The magician would do something and stand in front of her and take his bow, and, and they would never acknowledge them. Pamela Hayes has been working with her husband, Johnny Thompson, for 20 years. But even as an assistant, she has power because she seized it. When I met John and married him, I said, now listen, I'm an actress, I have my own life, and I'm not going to carry your stupid birds on and off the stage. OK, fine. One reason she has power is because she gets laughs, as Trixie, the reluctant assistant who accurately sees herself as her magician's equal. So my character is an old broad from Las Vegas with chewing gum and an attitude that is like, let's get it over with. Charlotte Pendragon is also her husband's equal on stage, a relationship central to their success. This equality gave us on stage relationship, the chance for conflict, the chance for uh, a growing 
in the performance. The female assistant is a very essential part of the, the relationship that makes the magic happen, but it's not always the obvious. And so in my training, it was, it was about empowering the magician by bringing all these elements together and bringing a lot of your focus towards him. Working with Jeff McBride, Luna, daughter of famed magician Shimada, performs some traditional assistant duties. Here she's the levitatee, for instance, but she can do and does far more. I'm at a point of my life where I can join forces with other magicians and working together with Luna helps me express a certain part of myself and also a relationship that I could never express before. A very powerful woman magician and a very powerful male magician working together. Not a male dominant magician subjugating a woman assistant, but two magicians, two aspects of the magician. For me, um, it's, it's very important to be able to present an image to women that is, that is empowering. Magic has been a, a male dominated profession for so many so many years and uh, it's only recently that women have begun to come into their own personal power and are awakening and accessing that. Um, in folklore and legend, uh, the, the sorceress, the oracle, the seer, the witch healer, the shamaness, they've always been with us since the beginning of time. Things are looking up for female magicians and even female assistants. But women still have a long way to go in performance magic. One trick symbolizes how far. Of the many different illusions that feature outrages to the body, the dominant trick. The ultimate magic trick of the 20th century, sawing a woman in half. Now, first of all, on the outward level, that's grotesque. What are we doing here? And why are we doing it to cha-cha music? <laughs> There's something about taking a beautiful woman as opposed to a man who has, you know, a strong, powerful hero type and putting them in a compromising position and then doing all these torturous things to them. It, it has an emotional impact on the audience. It hits that button. When Blackstone stepped up to his first midriff in the 1930s, the grand sawing illusion was little more than a decade old but already hundreds of women had been divided worldwide. The trick was invented or refined, it depends on who you ask, by British variety magician P.T. Selbit, the former Percy Tibbles of London, an illusionist already famous for tricks involving the stabbing, stretching, and crushing of women. American Horace Golden claimed he invented the trick, and he certainly improved it by not just sawing through his subject, but actually creating two distinct pieces. Golden's initial mistake was to cut up a man, but eventually he used women exclusively and a very large blade. This happened in the early 1920s, not a coincidence for illusion designer Jim Steinmeier. It's interesting looking at what was happening there, uh, that people had been slightly desensitized to a lot of that through World War I, that uh, women's suffrage was playing a big role in, uh, in the world and that the, there, there was a, a role for a new woman, and that perhaps some of this, maybe accidentally, magicians had stumbled into a kind of social statement being made. Not everyone sees partitioning women on stage as sexist and grotesque. Theologian Robert Neal. It's the shamanistic experience of being destroyed, turned into a skeleton or into parts, and all of it being put back together again. I want to be whole, and if I feel I'm coming apart psychologically or socially or physically, uh, I need to get somehow get back together again. And a magician sort of illustrates the scene, and therefore is, to me, giving hope. Which doesn't explain why it has to be a woman or the worldwide success of Peruvian magician Ricciardi Jr., whose grisly buzz sawing of his blonde daughter included the audience invited up to view her entrails but did not end with the rejoining of the bifurcated blonde. Sometimes Ricciardi just walked off stage. It's a trick, someone said to him once. Of course, said Ricciardi, but the real question is, was it well done?
I think that the, the, the house of magic has many rooms in it, and there's room for everybody. If you just want to do card tricks, there's a group. There's a great group of guys waiting for you. You know. A trick well done is all they ask for in the rooms of the House of Magic, and that's one of Magic's lasting appeals. Surrounded by looming grand illusions, there will always be space available for card tricks, for old pros like Johnny Thompson, and those following in his footsteps like the remarkable Jamie Ian Swiss. There will be room in the House of Magic for the mentalists, like Max Maven, confounding their audiences with knowledge, not props. You see, I maintain it is not a difficult task to manipulate the psychological processes of the adult human mind, and to prove this, we'll try something all together, and we'll see how many of you I connect with this evening. So if you would, please extend your right hand, everyone. If you're confused, that's the one on this side. Good. Extend your right thumb. Extend your right forefinger. Excellent. Make a circle of the thumb and forefinger and touch it to your chin. No, that's your cheek. <laughs> and there will be room for the innovators, like Hiawatha, making ancient skills unique through quiet showmanship. Lance Burton's big show is almost over. One of his last illusions is packing up the portable props and the underclad female familiars. But his work as a magician doesn't end when the curtain falls. He feels a responsibility to his art that transcends performance. There's a lot of knowledge that isn't in books, it isn't in lectures, that's passed on from teacher to student to the next student by word of mouth. And basically that's how magic was learned for the last 5,000 years. And what I try to do with the kids is I try to pass along uh, things that I feel are important uh, as a magician, especially to have a career as a professional magician. I try to pass along things that they can't get from another source. Every year in Las Vegas, Siegfried and Roy sponsor the Desert Magic Seminar, where student magicians from all over the world come to compete and learn. Magicians like Jason Dillon Ace, Ashley Springer, Thomas Meyer. Lance Burton hosts a luncheon during the seminar, putting the young hopefuls together with the old sleight of hands. They can read magic books and find secrets to tricks and, and learn moves, you know, how to make the card disappear. They can learn all that from other sources. But what I try and give them is insight that I've gained through experience or that was passed on to me by another professional magician. Other professional magicians like Channing Pollock and Johnny Thompson. Once heroes, then teachers, and now friends. No, wait, I have to tell you the rabbit act. This, All right. this is why you don't do rabbit acts. I had a beautiful $500 set of tails made, and I was working the Playboy Club, so I said, this is perfect. I'm going to do rabbits. So I rehearsed this act, and then I bought this beautiful set of tails. And the first time I tried the act, you know, birds defecate and urinate all in one shot, but rabbits don't. Oh, and they, tell us all about that. Yes, the first time out, they all did a number on me and ruined the $500 set of tails. And this is back in, in the 60s when $500 for a tails was a lot of money. So then I tried Pampers. I put costumes on them because of the Playboy. I put little bow ties and jackets. 
but they leak. <laughs> That's why I went back to birds. I remember one time when I was first really hanging out with, with Johnny Thompson, I went over to his house one day, and John helped me and worked. we worked on some things I was doing with doves and, and, and just spent an afternoon with him. And then I you know, packed all my stuff up, and I was putting it back in my car, and I was like, I felt guilty that I had taken his whole afternoon, and he had given me all this, these gifts of knowledge, and I was like, I felt like, you know, John, uh, you've done all this for me, and I, I don't know what to say, what to do. And, and he just said, you do the same for somebody else one day. And that's how it is. And that's how it is. Lance Burton has his own theater in Las Vegas now, a $27 million Egyptian hall for the next millennium, in honor of the grand illusion and the simple trick. As Eugene Berger says, there are many rooms in the House of Magic. There's the illusion room, and, and then there's this weird little room in the basement that some of us like to go to. And this is the room that asks, what does this all mean? What does this all mean? The first, last, uniquely human question. Is theatrical magic just a momentary diversion, or is it a glimpse into a fantastical world of dreams and nightmares, possibilities and promises? to my magic show. From every kid doing his first show to the master conjurers, present and past, what makes magic magic is that all the answers are yes. This program was made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the financial support of viewers like you. This is PBS.